Hello and welcome to another segment in our video series on the behaviorist model, its principles, and eventually in future installments, step-by-step -step how to do it videos for the various ABA practices and procedures. I'm Tom McIntyre, Dr. Mack of BehaviorAdvisor.com. Thanks for joining me today. In earlier installments, we looked at how the behaviorist model for explaining human behavior compares with other models that attempt to do the same. We also ventured into the earlier classical school of the behaviorist view. We've just dipped our toes into the behaviorist waters and will wade deeper into the model as we move toward applied behavior analysis, its principles, and its practice. Let's look now at the development of the model from one that paired two stimuli to create new reactions to what is known as the operant school of behaviorism. One that's concerned not just with actions and their stimuli, but also attends to the consequences that result from playing those behaviors. Now, to the modern behaviorist, every behavior has an antecedent and a consequence. If there are multiple stimuli previous to the behavior, the one immediately before the behavior is the one that's known as the antecedent. And we can modify behaviors, the B, by manipulating what comes before the A or the antecedent and what comes after the C or the consequences. An antecedent, that most recent stimulus before the behavior, spurs the behavior to occur. It sparks it. It sets the fire to the fuse. Now, whether the behavior occurs again in the future is going to depend on what follows the action. What is the consequence? In other words, in situations that happen over and over again, those antecedents, we keep doing the same things, those same actions, because it's brought a payoff, benefits, those consequences during those times. We don't show other behaviors when an antecedent event, that spark for our actions, appears because the behavior we tried once before didn't work well in that situation or the new action we tried out didn't bring any more benefits than the action that we were using already, so why would we bother to switch? In most cases, to be tempted to engage in a new response when that event or that antecedent happens, we would need to be convinced that there's a very good chance of it bringing more benefits than our present response. So let's review. What is the driving thought behind ABA? All behavior is divinely inspired due to a bad rash? The celestial alignment of the planets? No. The most recent stimulus, called the antecedent, sparks a behavior to happen. But whether that behavior continues to do so depends on what follows that action. If a benefit follows, if there's a positive payoff for that action, the behavior will be shown again after that particular stimulus. And perhaps similar ones when we're in new situations where we haven't acted before. We go with our default response. Yes, according to behaviorists, those ABAers all behavior is learned. Other models would say, well, what about hallucinations or the ability to predict outcomes and, and change our usual ways, our ability to analyze and bring in emotions, and other non-learned causes. Now, most behaviorists would not deny that those capabilities exist, but if they can't measure them and account for the degree of their influence, they say then we must ignore them. We look at the observable and the measurable. 
we are behavioral scientists. So we must ignore those things that we cannot measure. Other models say, well, that's like telling us not to think of a red rhinoceros. It's imposterous. Hmm. Who is that prominent figure that we associate with this newer school of behaviorism? Let's see. Operator, newer school, mice. Who are we talking about? Yes, the eminent Dr. Skinner, seen here as a young scientist, and then again as the renowned senior figure in the field of animal behavior. His experiments, conducted in the finest tradition of the scientific method of investigation, shed light on how small mammals learn and modify their behaviors due to the consequences following those actions. His recorded findings and the principles of behavior that emanated from them form the basis of our modern practice in homes and in schools when we wish to build or modify behaviors in kids and colleagues. Yes, Dr. Skinner provided us with a framework that we now refer to as being operant conditioning that model for understanding how mammals learn. And the premise of this model again? Right, all behavior is learned. All the behaviors we show, we display them because of what has happened to us throughout our lives, how the environment has acted upon us, the things and the people and their responses to our actions. We have learned from that. We have been taught by them. And there are two categories of consequences. Four if we break them down into subcategories. Come on now, think back to Psych 101. Or maybe the professional meetings where you've spoken about a youngster with whom you have concerns about his or her behavior pattern. We might speak about how we promote appropriate behavior in our classrooms with rewards and penalties. But behaviorists use more exacting terminology with very stringent criteria for being included in those liked and disliked consequence categories. Yes, there are so many things that can happen to us once we display an action but they fall into four groupings by their effect on our behavior. You remember reinforcement and punishment and positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. Punishment, the positive and negative type. Positive punishment? Ah, we get into that in the next segment of our video series concerned about these consequences. But think of positive and negative, not in personal and emotional opinions. I mean, give me a peanut butter sandwich for lunch, and I am a happy guy. I view that sandwich as being a positive thing. For others, it's a negative thing. So that same item, having a pos being seen positively or negatively by different people, too wishy-washy, too vague and nebulous. When we think of positive and negative we th in the behaviorist terms, we think in mathematical constructs and a number line. That something is added on or something is subtracted. And be aware that these consequences apply to all mammals. The principles came about from Dr. Skinner's experiments with pigeons and lab rats. He didn't work with human beings, except with regards to his daughter when she was an infant, and you can uh, do a search on the internet. Just choose a reliable site, not one of those wacky rumor-starting ones. His daughter turned out just fine. But yes, ABA applies to another mammal, us. And we're going to look more closely at those consequences, the two types of reinforcement and the two types of punishment in our next installment in this video series. Please join me for those videos and join me too on the open internet and Facebook. Look for BehaviorAdvisor.com 
on both of those.